I've heard about the next woman. That's me. <laughs> Um, it's, it's re I was at an FM event last week, um, FM Inspired, some of you will know the event, very good one day event, and um, I asked a question of the audience, a very similar size audience to this, and I said, how many of you in the last six months have been to an event that's nothing to do with FM, so maybe an HR event, or an IT event, or a finance event, anybody here? So we're, we're moving, aren't we, we're moving outside of FM, because I think one of the challenges is that we are very good at talking to ourselves. Look at the, the great event today, great conference, but this is FMs talking to FMs. We're never going to change anything if we continue to do that. So I would encourage more of you to get to other events. I went back to my old school two years ago to talk about FM as a career. And we've got a couple of the girls have gone to do engineering degrees with a view to going into facilities management. And I kind of think I had a little role to play in that. And I think it's, it's our individual responsibility to get out there and talk about this incredible industry, because we love working in FM, otherwise we wouldn't still be here, would we? So, sorry, I get on my high horse a bit. You can tell I'm very passionate about facilities management. So anyway, um, my session, my how-to session is really about uh, collaboration. Um, there's a very long title, so we won't worry too much about that. But what I want to do is, for the next half hour, is just take you through the why, the what, and the how. Some of you will have seen the Simon Sinek <coughs> TED talk about the Golden Circle. Anybody come across that? Great stuff. So you'll understand why I'm approaching it this way. So I'm going to talk about why we would want collaborative relationships at work in the first place. What makes it a success? And how do we need to behave to drive that success? Because the how is so critical. So um, I was going to mention an ISO standard as well, and now I'm a bit embarrassed about it. Um, it's actually the British Standard 11,000, which is uh, sorry, yeah, 11,000, which is a British standard on collaboration. Which, if you haven't read it, it's really interesting. And particularly in facilities management, more and more organisations are actually looking for accreditation to the standard to show collaboration, particularly between client and service provider. But um, but first, these guys. Please tell me you know who they are. Last week, I had some really blank faces, and I realised that I am. I am that old generation in FM now, the one that I sit in that room and go, oh, it's the same old people again talking. <laughs> I am that same old person. So Simon and Garfunkel, um, why, do I, why would I put them up when I'm talking about collaboration, do you think? Bridge over troubled water, very, very poignant. So they were, um, I'm sorry? One writes them and one sings them. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's collaboration. So back in the 1960s, their, their first duo was called Tom and Jerry. Did you know that? There you go. Good. If you're ever in a pub quiz, that's what Simon and Garfunkel were known as before, Tom and Jerry. And they were um, one of the biggest selling duos in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, they had a big falling out, one of their big falling outs in, in the early 70s and didn't speak to each other for eight years. Um, their record company wasn't very happy about this because the collaboration, the output when they were together, made a lot of people a lot of money. So maybe that was their reason why. Who knows? So they, uh, they got together again in 1980 at Central Park. Do any of you remember that concert? Um, and it, they had 500,000 people watch the concert, and it was the seventh biggest attendance of all time. For a, for a live concert, so a pretty, pretty big concert. Um, and it was free to attend, which is interesting. But off the back of it, guess what they made? A lot of money off record sales, because in those days, in 1980, 81, we still had those things called records. And some of you will remember <laughs> before the days of uh, downloading music. Anyway, the, the point to this is that when they were both interviewed after that concert, um, they were interviewed about their relationship. And what's fascinating to find out is they arrived separately at the venue in New York. They didn't speak to each other before they went on stage. They went on stage and did their thing in the most amazing way. And then when they went off stage, they didn't speak to each other again for years. So is that collaboration? It's, a, it's an interesting question because I would say, well, it is. Because if their end goal, if their common purpose was to deliver an amazing concert, fantastic music that people want to buy, does it really matter whether they like each other or not? So that's maybe a question I just want to put out there because a lot of times when we work with clients who say we need to strengthen our collaborative relationships, sometimes they think, well, we don't, I don't actually like that individual, so how can I work collaboratively with them? Well, you can if you're focusing on 
the end goal, the common purpose. So I thought that was quite an interesting approach. Um, Art Garfunkel is always more minded to reunite than Paul Simon is, because Paul Simon's now gone and done his own thing. He's, uh, he's touring with James Taylor this year, so that's quite an interesting collaboration as well. But collaboration for me is about having that, that common goal. Um, this is also from a BIFM guidance note. I'm sorry, Ed. Everything you've said not to do, I'm now doing. But I think this one's particularly useful. It's from a, a best practice guidance on supplier relationships. And what it does is it tells us where collaboration sits in a pyramid. So if you take examples outside of work, we could start with a very transactional relationship. So what would that be outside of work? A transactional relationship. Yeah. You go and buy a pint of milk or a loaf of bread, hand over your money, you, you get your product, end of relationship. What about a contractual one then? What would that be? Window cleaner, yeah, mobile phone, uh, maybe your mortgage. Yeah, anything where there's a, a term of contract and there's an agreed price. So you're paying an agreed price for an agreed product or service over a period of time. And then we have our value added. So this is where we get into things like um, gym membership. Okay, so you might pay your £600 for the year. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how much it is these days. <laughs> you can tell, can't you? <laughs> and, um, and as part of that added value, you might get a, a bonus of six sessions with a personal trainer or free classes or get someone to join for half price. Because what they're trying to do by giving you added value is retain your custom. I must tell you very briefly, it's a very quick story about my old managing director. I just have to quickly look around the room to make sure he's not here, because um, he still works in FM. Um, when we had our office, uh, John Lang in Victoria, downstairs was an LA fitness gym. And um, my managing director decided on the 4th of January, it was the first day back at work, that you know what's going to happen, don't you? That he decided he was going to get a fit that year and join LA Fitness. And he did, and he signed up, direct debit for the year. It was about 600 quid. And he came back to the office with this fantastic rucksack, beautiful, that said LA Fitness. I think it was in neon pink on the black rucksack. And about three months later, we were talking about the gym. And he said, most expensive rucksack I've ever bought. <laughs> 600 pound rugs. <laughs> so I'm not sure he got his added value at that point. <laughs> then we move into collaborative relationships. And I think if you look at this outside work, we're looking at things like parent and teacher when you're collaborating for the education of your children. So you both want to get the same result, but maybe you have to put in different things and you get different things out of the relationship. And what about our partnership? What would a an example of a partnership be outside of work? A wife. <laughs> so why would a partnership be different from a collaborative relationship? I think this is a real dilemma for us. It's more equal. Partnership is more. A bit of tension, shared risk, yeah. I think, and it, there isn't really a definition of this that suits facilities management, I think, but I think partnership is where actually what we jointly want is far more important than what I want or what you want. So sometimes we have to put our own requirements on the back burner because jointly, if we achieve something, it's better for both of us. Whereas a collaboration is we both give and we might both lose something as well. So... What we do in my organization, we call it corporate marriage guidance, <laughs> because actually what we see is a lot of organizations aiming for partnership, and I'm not really sure if that's realistic, because as human beings and as organizations, we act in our own self-interest. And if we want a true partnership, we have to be able to put that self-interest to one side. So let me ask you, whether you're a client or a service provider or whether you're on the outside of those relationships, what would you think the benefits are of having collaborative relationships? What's, what's the point to it? Yeah, get the best from both, both parties, all that knowledge and experience. Great, so you get the writer of the songs and the singer of the songs working together. What other benefits? Better communication because... Brilliant. So 
If we know where we're going, we're going to communicate better, we're going to get better results. So managing, managing risk in a certain way as well. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. So moving away from that master-servant relationship to having a shared strategy and a, a shared way forward, that common goal again. So these are some of the benefits that I see from true collaborative relationships. And I say collaborative rather than partnership, is you get those good outcomes. You get the, the great music performed by Simon and Garfunkel. You get new perspectives. So if we're genuinely collaborating and working together for the same common goal, we're going to encourage and be open to other perspectives rather than just trying to do it the way we've always done it. And I think if we're really honest, as much as we like to say we are open to innovation and open to new ideas, generally we're not. Because we live in our comfort zone. Ian? What I'm missing here is the longevity of such a relationship drives from investments from both sides. Absolutely. So the longevity of these relationships. So we'll talk in a moment about things like vested contracts and how that drives long-term success for both parties. I think just to get here, I think there's... Um we have to think about the trust. So this is amazing, but it's that trust element. Have you seen my next slide? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're absolutely right. So all these things are potential benefits of collaboration. Um, new perspectives, being able to learn together, grow together, uh, creating new networks. And that means you know, you're, grow you're both growing your businesses as well and your networks for success as you move forward. Um, shared ownership, reduced conflict, so if you're collaborating and you've got that trust, then any issues that come up, you can anticipate before, they, before a relationship turns nasty or turns toxic. Um, longer lasting solutions and a reduction of risk as well. So what makes collaboration work? There's lots of things, but I think it's very simplest from my experience. There's two things. One is that common purpose. You have to both really buy into an objective, a long-term goal, whatever it may be. But everybody has to buy into it and understand it. Um, and there's no point people saying, yes, they agree to it, and then going and behaving in a slightly different way. How many times have you been in a meeting where everybody sits together and they all gr agree and nod, and it's like, yeah, this is fantastic, yeah, we can sign up to that, and then one party leaves the room. Okay, I'm not looking at anybody here. One party leaves the room, and everybody left in the meeting room goes, we call it rolling your eyes out loud. Okay, that takes away immediately all that trust that's been built. So when we're talking about common purpose, it's got to be real. It's got to be, you've got to live it. You've got to live it. Yeah. Quick observation. Dave Market, public-private partnership, PPP, is a bit toxic, got bad press, because the commercial, I guess, purposes are very different from both parties. Public need, but private gain. I'm not sure what your views on that, but I think PPP is a very good model, but it's toxic now. So Ed makes a really good point about the public-private partnerships, and the commercial model there is that the public sector wanted to save money, and the private sector wants to make money. And often we look at those sort of commercial models and we say, well, how can that be a win-win? But actually, it, it can, because as a client, if you... And, and Steve Gladwin uses this term. He says, if you love your supplier's profit and you help them make that profit, then actually everybody will win because they will do more for you. And I think that's something that came out quite clearly this morning when we were talking about economics, is that you've got to have a commercial model that works for everybody, otherwise we are going to fall back into that master-servant relationship again. So profit is good, profit is not a dirty word, and I think that's also part of what we've got to do working in this industry, is be really proud to make money and not be embarrassed about it. You know, not say, oh, actually, we want to earn more than a single-digit profit margin. Michael. Yeah, it was coming on from that, yeah, bilateral model, again, you've just have to assume that they're by Belarus
okay? And that's fact, that's why the advice came about, to build schools and hospitals. The problem came where we then started selling them on for more money than they were originally making. And that's what got the politicians and that's where the collaboration fails, because the agreed, the common purpose to start with with PFI was to, to fund these buildings that in 25 or 30 years could be given back in, in the same state that they were, they were uh, created in the first place. And of course, if they're sold on to make money, then you, you have to question the, the common purpose has gone, hasn't it? So I think whatever the commercial model is, it's got to be successful for everybody involved from the start. And we heard earlier on today about, you know, if someone's asking you to bid something that you're not comfortable with, that you think is going to be really hard to manage, then don't bid it. We've got to start calling out some of these things and saying, we're not going to, we're not going to work that way. We're not going to work for a 3% profit margin. You know, let's, let's be realistic. If we want to improve the gross domestic product and all the things that we heard from Vicky this morning, we've got to, we've got to be a bit bolder, I think, as an industry. Uh, so that's a little bit about the what. And how do we do it? This is really about the, the behaviours, the guiding principles. So how many of you have come across vested contracts? Okay, so vested is a model that's been around for a few years, but it's very much a collaborative um, commercial model, a collaborative contract based on some particular guiding principles. What we find really interesting is that from a procurement point of view, it's, it's a very simple model, but it can take a very long time to develop and to agree the contractual terms. Um, what we often don't find from the procurement teams is this understanding of the behavior that will make it work or help it to fail. So let me just touch, touch very briefly on some of the, um, the behaviours. And just to highlight that what a behaviour is, okay, this is not pink and fluffy stuff. This is really important business language that we, ha we have to understand. Um, a behaviour, so these guiding principles that make a commercial model work, are things that can be seen, heard, and felt by others. So think about things like... Um, the rolling your eyes, you know, when somebody walks out of the room, or how we talk about someone to a colleague. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to say something a bit controversial now. Is that okay? You might want to turn the camera off. <laughs> so this morning, the panel, okay, the, the panel that was sitting on the stage this morning, what, what I noticed is very interesting is when one person talked, the other four looked really bored. <laughs> and one of them was on their iPad, and one of them was looking anywhere but at the audience. And for me, when we're talking about behavior, it's everything that we exhibit at every moment. It's about the integrity to be who you are, even when you don't think anybody's watching, because actually people are watching all the time. So apologies for being controversial, but I just think it's really important to highlight how we behave as individuals and as, a, as an industry. So here are some of the guiding principles around vested contracts, particularly. And you can have contracts that have... Uh, elements are vested without needing to have a vested trademark contract. So things like um, integrity. So as I said just now, integrity is how we behave even when no one's watching. Really important. That whole thing about starting with positive intent with everything we do. Um, autonomy. So making sure that both parties in a collaborative relationship have freedom to do what they need to do within a boundary. So as, as Disney say, Disney say, you know, make sure people understand the, um, the boundaries of the dance floor and then let them dance. Let them do their John Travolta or their cha-cha-cha. Okay, I'm not very good at dancing, but, <laughs> but autonomy is within the framework. Let people do what they need to do. Um, have ambition. So as a collaborative partnership, make sure you're ambitious. Make sure you push the boundaries. Don't be limited. And it's, this isn't just about bringing innovative ideas to me at our monthly meeting. This is about, as a, as a partnership, as a collaboration, what can we do to really push things and be different and make things better for our end users, for those people who are actually experiencing our services? Um, and we have equality, which is really about not always having equal stakes, but making sure that everybody gets what they need based on that common purpose. Um, honesty goes without saying, doesn't it? You know, it's... The, the, my managing director who bought the £600 rucksack, he always said to me, Liz, I don't, mind, I don't mind what happens in my business as long as I know before the Evening Standard report it. 
And I think it's, it's not always about being honest about crises, but it's about just being honest about frustrations, feelings, barriers, hurdles, and successes as well. Um, and then we've got our reciprocity, which is a great American word, but that's really about give and take. It's making sure that, again, the collaboration is fair. Um, loyalty, make sure that we have each other's back all the time, not just in public, but in private as well. If you sign up to a collaboration, if you sign up to a marriage, you're not going to go slagging off your other half, are you? One hopes. So <laughs> that loyalty is key. Um, but <laughs> as my colleague over here said, all underpinned by trust. There's a great paper, it's a book actually, by Stephen Covey, Stephen Covey Jr. called The Speed of Trust. If you haven't read it, please do. It's incredible. It talks about how trust in society, in the market, and in organizations only comes if we have self-trust to start with. So we've got to understand and be able to trust ourselves, our competencies, our capabilities, and our intent before we can build trusting relationships with anybody else. And if you think about people you've worked with who you don't trust, often it's because you know they don't trust themselves, that maybe they're doubting their own capability to do the job. So I think that's really really key. So those are some of the guiding principles and behaviours that will help with a collaborative relationship. Um, how do we instill those behaviours? It is a learning process. If people aren't behaving in that way, it doesn't mean they don't know how or they can't. It's just that maybe we haven't encouraged them to. We haven't shown them the importance of behaving in that way. And we have to reinforce it. So it's not. this isn't a training course. This isn't a come to us for a day and we'll teach your people how to behave, and overnight everything will be miraculous and wonderful. It doesn't happen like that. Reinforcing the behaviours, catching people doing it right, is really helpful, so that sort of constant drip feed. What we encourage people to do is, when they have their monthly meetings or their quarterly reviews, is to have one of those behaviours as an agenda item, and to start talking about what does that actually mean? What does trust mean to us in this relationship? Where are some examples of where it's worked? Where are some examples of where, where it hasn't worked? And to just keep those conversations alive. But in my view, the most important thing is this, is every single one of us has to look in the mirror and look at how we behave. Because if we want the people around us to start behaving differently, they're gonna look at us and they're gonna think that however we behave, is the okay way to behave in the workplace. So whether that's rolling your eyes out loud, whether that's being late for a meeting, whether that's canceling a WebEx call when everybody's just dialed into it. And trust me, that's happened to me recently. They, these things that to us are sometimes just business decisions that we make, we've got to be really careful because as we look in the mirror, other people are looking at us as well. So that would be my big tip to you is think about how you're behaving. Um, and on the subject of trust, I just wanted to share this one with you. I hope you can see from the back. It's a, it's a Dilbert. It says, according to the anonymous online employee survey, you don't trust management. What's up with that? Oh, right. Anonymous survey. Hmm. So uh, that's a bit of a whiz through about collaboration. I hope it's given you some food for thought. Does anybody have any questions or comments? So, uh, Liz, I, a lot of that resonates, and my experience is that there's been moments, and that moment might be six months long, where you have a really collaborative relationship with us, I'm client side at the moment, with a supplier partner, normally in a kind of regional or local team. What happens then is outside of that um, boundary, either their organisation or ours starts to come under some sort of external pressure, or key people move, and then it starts to drift. I just wonder if you've got any thoughts on how to really sustain this kind of relationship. That's a really good question, Nick. I think a lot of it comes back to the common purpose again, but also at that point, I think you have to have a lot of courage to go back to that organization and almost ask them to back away. It's, it's very difficult, isn't it? So if, if I work for a big service provider and I've got this fantastic relationship with my client and then my company, my organisation changes direction or I guess something that happens quite often is my commercial director might come to me and say, we need you to make a few more percent. 
margin or you know can you make a bit more money out of this contract and if we've got a collaborative relationship it's very difficult for me to manage that so I think courage and honesty at that point is the only way to tackle it I don't think there's an easy an easy answer has anybody else come across that Ed well, I guess what's one of my observations in the last 12 months is, especially government, again, with government people, is they're lacking trust in the big brands for future outsourcing. So they've lost trust in our world to deliver the, the outsource solution. That's going to take time to recover, if at all. I'm not sure what people's views are on that, but to me that's an example where collaboration has gone horribly wrong and it's, there's no real solution at the moment. Yeah, hi. Uh, Robert, can if I work for NG, one of the uh, big brands the government hasn't lost confidence in yet? Um, <laughs> um, I think really fascinating uh, about the vested contract thing. And so I, we, I tender for a lot of contracts in, in my uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, work life. And we encounter a lot of situations where we're taking on new contracts where the, there's been disastrous relationships, but also sometimes where it's been really good relationships. So really some comments on, you know, do, do, sub, do uh, customers really need to change contractor to, to make things better? Um, and likewise, when a new contractor's coming in and in reality, all you can really change is some of the senior management in that situation. How do you, how do you start to press the reset button in that situation? That's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because again, we go back to some of the discussions this morning where people are just retendering every every three years and going out to market and getting the same results. What was the quote? Was it something about doing the same thing? Insanity. Yeah, insanity. I do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So I think I think you you don't have to go to market. You don't have to go for a new supplier. If you've got a relationship that isn't truly collaborative, you can still change that if the will is there to do it and if those behaviours have agreed and if both parties want to make it work and you can agree a common purpose, you can change people's behaviour. Yeah. Ian? I'm just wondering, well, you already made a comparison to marriage or any relationship between two people. I would say the same thing here. So if one of the two parties starting to behave like that, there's two things you can do. You can fix it or get away because that's the way it goes. If you can't fix it, don't stay together because you both will be utterly uh, horrified and, 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 and miserable. I had something like that when I was a procurement manager and actually my uh, uh, sales director said, well, we need some, some extra money going out of that. And I said, actually, I'm not going to do that because we are going to lose these contractors and our facility managers will have a problem there and our customers. And he bought that. But you have to stand for your contractors. So it has to come from both sides. And, and also it's that language of the business again, isn't it? If you've got to push back and be bold and be honest and talk to the finance director in his own language. Uh, interesting what you said about marriage. Um, I, I'm a lapsed Catholic. I don't know if there is such a thing. I was brought up a Roman Catholic. And um, before marriage in the Roman Catholic Church, you have to go for six months of instruction. Any of you come across that? So you have to go to, uh, to church and they teach you and your future spouse um, mostly how to communicate with each other. So you agree before you get married the rules of the game. And they also tell you what to do when things start to go wrong. And, and in marriage, if you look at relate, for example, if you look at the figures, things start to go wrong at one year, at two and a half years, and at seven years. It's really interesting. And I think there's a lot of comparison between marriage and uh, work relationships. <laughs> I think probably to a degree on that, some of that theme, I think there's, there's one thing that I kind of ask and for people's views and observe. One is that we tend to kind of go into a contract and then everyone sits back and thinks the hard work's done. I think people realise don't we need to think more about that relationship. We've both got to work at it. You, you get into that relationship, you've got to work, you've got to have that positive tension to develop. At all too many FM contracts I see from client and supplier side, it's almost just about just turning the wheel. That kind of real desire to, to kind of excel and be driven doesn't seem to exist sometimes. And I wondered whether or not some of our commercial models, and we go back to that commoditization, I mean, as long as we ever have kind of a cost plus open book environment where we just look at a labor rate, we kind of talk ourselves into that downward spiral. I don't know if anyone has a view whether our commercial models are driving some of this, whether we've just lost that excitement to drive each other 
in terms of what we're trying to do. Thanks, Liz. Um, Wendy Cuthbert, I'm sort of Barclays, but sort of ABSA. So I'm, I'm the African part of the room. Um, I wonder whether or not from the client side, it's because we're actually putting the wrong measures on our people. So it's nothing to do with the commercial model, but actually if you look at it, how do we reward on the client side great performance from our people? Is it because they think they will get a better reward or better recognition for finding fault with the supplier, defending their job because they are the ones, if they weren't there, everything would go to rack and ruin? And I just wonder whether or not we have our incentivization wrong. And if you then turn around and say to your internal client team on the client side, actually your success is directly attributable to the success of the partner not finding fault. And if you put a positive spin on it, it puts a completely different relationship in place. Because it goes from fault finding, finger pointing, to actually looking for ways that you can work together. One of the one of the best contracts that that we've got with um, in this collaborative nature is with with Transport for London, so semi public sector really, and it's cost plus with a guarantee maximum price. But there's pay and gain share either side of the the guarantee maximum price. So as a service provider, we're incentivised to save money because we can keep some of it. Um, and actually, what's driving TfL is saving money. So there's a there's a innovation mechanism or an ideas mechanism around saving money, changing specs, doing whatever you like, and that goes through a process. Um, so, but it incentivizes both parties to achieve what they want to achieve, which is TFL needs to save money because they're gunny, and uh, the more insolvent, by the way, TFL and um, the service provider who um, who wants to make some more money, really. So, I mean, it, it works really well. Um, I think it's, some of it's down to the detail of the contractual mechanism and how it works, but it, it's worked really well for us so far. So it seems to me that in this room, there's a real will to do this anyway. And I, I wonder if, you know, it's, it's not us, it's everybody else who's not here that, that's holding back um, the industry. I think Wendy makes a really valid point about the, the retained client. And something we come across a lot is where the client who has been managing the day-to-day -day service provision then has that taken away. And the reason they continue to want to, to do that is because it's, it's in their comfort zone. And often, I think, as organizations, what we don't do is say to people, here's what you do. You turn inwards into your organization. You manage those internal stakeholders. And I think we don't tell people that their roles are changing. And we also don't give them the skills or knowledge or the anticipated behaviors to be able to do that. And it sounds so simple when you say it, but it's, it's tough when you're, when you're outsourcing, you're going through the tender process and you're, you're, you're starting that new marriage, whatever it is with your new service provider. It's, it's doing all the other things as well. It takes a lot of time, a lot of investment. But just what we would invest into a marriage, hopefully. Um, lots of time, lots of effort. So any other comments or questions? Yes, hi, Liz. Um, do you have any guidance you could offer on collaborating at distance or across borders and different time zones? I love time zones. Not, not. At nine o'clock last night, I was um, having a call with somebody in Philadelphia, and uh, he said, well, you can, you, you can do this for me tonight. And I was going, it's going to take me about three hours, and it means I've got to call one of my team out. And he said, but it's only whatever it was, three, four in the afternoon. I was like, it's not, it's not. So I, it's, it's a real key issue. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer. A lot of organizations use um, WebExing and things and so people can call in from home in the morning or in the evening. If I, if I didn't have to do that, I wouldn't because I'm a great believer in quality of life and having a, having a balance. But until we can teleport ourselves, or Richard Branson gives us that spaceship that goes straight up and comes straight down again. I, I don't know if there's an easy answer. Does anybody have any tips, Steve? We actually, um, we have got involved with doing duplicate calls. So for example, we'll do one at eight o'clock in the morning to catch the Far East, and then one do at 4.30 in the afternoon to catch the West Coast of America. And that's proved beneficial. You get the same message out on the same physical day, but you have to do it twice. Anybody else have solutions to that? Uh, 
A real basic solution is uh, to set every call at 12 o'clock during the day UK time. Works great for us. It's good, good for Asia. Uh, and, and the US just has to get up early. And Asia stays up late. I hope your colleagues aren't here from the US. <laughs> But I, but I still think with collaboration, it's going to need some investment of time and resources because there's no better way to collaborate and build relationships than face-to-face -face in a room. And we fight with clients sometimes when they say, well, Liz, come and do the training by WebEx. I was like, no, no. You might meet your partner online on Tinder or Grindr or whatever it is. You might meet them online, but you're still going to re meet them. You've got to meet them face to face before you know if they're the right person for you. And actually, collaboration at work is just the same. WebEx is fine initially, but if you want to build real relationships with that underpinning trust, it has to be done face to face. So, a bit of a whiz through. Thank you so much for your questions and uh, input. And um, thank you.